We're going to pick up with our study of the causes of the Chinese Civil War by looking at where we left off, which was when the Double Tenth succeeded in overthrowing the Manchu Dynasty. However, we did address in the last recording that this was an incomplete rev revolution because no real changes were implemented. Some of the same people were still in power. But, like I had said in the last recording, historian Michael Lynch says that the real significance of the Double Tenth was the fact that it showed the power of regionalism because in the Double Tenth, Independent provinces in China declared themselves to be independent and broke away from the central imperial government of the Manchus and decided to basically do their own thing. So in the end, a lot of these provinces still had feelings that they could control their particular region of China as they saw fit. We talked about the little double-cross deal that was made between Sun Yixin and Yuan Shikai at the end of the last recording. It was agreed that Yuan Shikai would be the president, which initially the people who broke away to form this Chinese Republic in the Double Tenth had wanted Sun Yuxin to be the president. But the agreement was that Yuan Shikai could be president in an exchange for an absolute guarantee that the Manchu dynasty would come to an end. So therefore, we pick up with the rule of Yuan Shikai. He is now considered to be the president of the Chinese Republic. But because we said that this revolution was incomplete, a lot of the issues that had led up to the revolution had not been completely addressed and changed. The fact that regionalism was still a, something that was proving to be an obstacle for Yuan Shikai in uniting the country of China together. They had broken away and declared themselves to be the Chinese Republic, but these independent provinces now did not want to come together and form a centralized government. Yuan Shikai never could bring the entire country together under one central government. Regionalism is a sign of political weakness, and it was something that was con going to continue as a major cause leading up to the actual outbreak of the Chinese Civil War. And then it was also an issue of how the war was fought and the outcome of it as well. So you want to ke keep in mind this key idea of regionalism, these different sections of the country that want to control themselves independently of each other and not unite under a central government. It's as much of a tension as the hatred towards foreign governments coming in and trying to carve up China. While Yuan Shikai was president of China, Sun Yuxin, who was this guy invited to be the first president but decided to give that position up, he reformed his thoughts and his ideas while he that he had originally started while being a political exile in the United States and therefore reformed a party which became known as the GMD or Guomindang. If you look on page 255 of your book, you're going to see two yellow sidebars, one on the side and one in the middle of the page, that give some in-depth information on who this person was, Sun Yuxin, and what his new party, the Guomindang, was all about, which was centered around what's called the three principles. So I would encourage you to stop the recording for a minute and take a look at both of these um, sections in yellow to get further understanding on who Sun Yixin was and what his three principles were all about. Even though we had mentioned in the last recording that uh, Sun Yixin and Yan Shikai had made that deal for Shikai to become president, after that happened, there was some continued manipulation between these two guys that showed how unstable the country still was. You can see, if you look at the bottom of 255 and top of 256, some of the actions that were taken, such as Sun Yuxin moving Yuan Shikai from his power base in Beijing to Nanjing, where he didn't have as much support. Yuan, on the other hand, tried to abolish regional assemblies and, pro and in the end proclaim himself to be emperor, which was kind of like a really bad decision on his part because it, lend it led itself to a loss of support for him and his eventual death in 1916. Meanwhile, Sun was exiled once again to the country of Japan. So both of these men made poor decisions um, once in power, but they also did set the stage for the outbreak of the Chinese Civil War in the next coming years. Once Yuan Shikai died in 1916, the country basically had no key figure to look for. He was the only thing that represented some semblance of national unity, and now he was dead. So at this point, this idea of regionalism, which I've emphasized, was going to come into play as the main feature that guided the country from the years 1916 to 1928. These warlords that controlled their independent sections of China, independent from each other, and they also battled with each other for control and more benefits and resources for their province. You can see a map of these warlords and where they position themselves in the country on page 256 in the middle. 
These warlords maintained their power because they each had private armies to back them up. They ran their territories independently of each other. They organized and taxed the people how they saw fit. They had their own laws, their own currencies, and continually battled each other for more power and control. None of them were willing to ever consider the idea of resigning some of their power in order to create an entire central government and military under one Chinese country. They each wanted to have basically their own parts of China to themselves, similar to the idea of in the United States, the Confederacy seceding and wanting to have their own way of life, their own laws, their own currency. So you can draw some comparisons there. If you look at the bottom of page 256, you can see who suffered the most from this warlord period. The continuous fighting between the warlord, warlords over more territory and power um, affected the peasants the most. And we mentioned in the last recording that the peasants made up a huge portion of the population of China. And with this continual fighting between warlords, it just increased the humiliation felt by the people. They got sick and tired of this continuous fighting between warlords of their own country in addition to the hatred and resentment that they felt towards the foreign powers. And so actually the warlords, even though they were emphasizing the role of regionalism, had an indirect effect in increasing nationalism. Many people in China wanted to see the warlords be removed from their power and for China to once again be reunited and to regain that sense of pride that they had once had and their heritage, which had been so significant in the past. So now many Chinese people were united in their frustration over the warlords. Sort of similar to how many peasants in Europe during the medieval times uh, resented and hated the, the lords and nobles over different estates because there was, again, constant warfare between some of those uh, noble lords for different areas and more power. And Eventually, more centralized nations were formed in Europe as a result of some of that frustration. So in China, there were some movements that took place that kind of showed how the people wanted to get rid of the warlords in China and also, once again, the foreign influence. The first one you can see at the top of 257 was the May 4th movement. This was led by a group of students in 1919 in the city of Beijing, and it was directed at the warlords, but it was also directed at some of the traditional culture, which some of the Chinese saw as leading to weakness. Um, we mentioned the slower agricultural methods that they had used, which had not kept up with the rest of the world. And they were also upset at the Japanese, and so some of this frustration in this May 4th movement was directed towards them. In the last unit we had about World War I, when we mentioned the Versailles Treaty, we mentioned that the Japanese rega uh, retained a province in China, the Shandong province, at the expense of the Chinese. Both the Japanese and Chinese had been part of the Allies. And so the Chinese were very upset that portions of their country were given over to the Japanese, even though they had helped the Allies. The significance of this movement you can see also on 257, it was basically that it was dedicated to change and to see China reborn again, like I mentioned previously, they wanted to regain that pride and heritage and sense of accomplishment that they had had in the past. And the fact that it was led by young people. They had received some inspiration from the Bolshevik movement that took place in Russia, which we had mentioned in the last unit, drew Russia out of the the First World War and established a communist government in that country. So some of these students were inspired by the fact that they had succeeded in Russia. It was a practical example for them. The other movement that took place to try to rid the country of the warlords was the full establishment of the Nationalist Party, the GMD that had been started by Sun Yixin, and also the emergence of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, which would be the two groups that ended up battling each other in the Chinese Civil War. Sun Yixin died in 1925, and by that point, the GMD had made very little progress towards the accomplishment of his three principles, which were mentioned in that yellow box on page 255. They, the reason for not making a whole lot of progress is because they had very little military support. And since the Double Tenth Movement, it was clearly shown that if you didn't have any military behind you, it was very hard to make real change in China. Yuan Shikai found that out to be true as president of the so-called Chinese Republic, he didn't have a lot of military support because these militaries were supporting independent warlords throughout the country. So the GMD by 1925 had very little military support either because it was directly during and after the time of the warlords. 
So there was a military leader who took control of the party and kind of shaped it and brought it together in a new direction. We have mentioned his name before as Jiang Zixi, and he was the military general who had been humiliated by Prince Chun, which was the, the regent who was trying to rule for Puyi, which was the last of the Manchu emperors. He was a very successful military general. You can see some of his background on 257. He had received military training in Japan and in the USSR. So his military strategies were developed. Um, it might be interesting to see why the USSR supported this nationalist group. You would obviously think that they would support this group, the Chinese Communist Party. But you can see that the USSR saw that they could possibly develop good relations with a nationalist China if they succeeded in the end. And given the fact that they share a border, the Soviets definitely had interest to make sure that China emerged as a country which would be favorable to theirs. The Soviets believed that the GMD had enough socialist principles that it would be uh, an organization that they could work with. But in addition to the nationalists gaining more organization and structure with um, General Jiang Jiaxi taking control, the Chinese Communist Party officially formed in 1921, as you can see here. These were mostly intellectuals, um, students and professors and people like that who thought about China's situation and tried to come up with intellectual solutions. They also lacked any real military strengths similar to the GMD. So in response to this, lack of military support from the GMD or the CCP, the two groups agreed to cooperate with each other. The GMD, who was already receiving some assistance from the USR, was kind of pressured to do so. So what was called the First United Front formed, and both groups, the GMD and the CCP, wanted to achieve their first main goal in uniting China, which was to get rid of the warlords. This was something that was absolutely necessary because if the warlords remained, China would remain forever divided. The second step after getting rid of the warlords to unify China would be to rid China of imperialist powers, which would be difficult to do as we've seen already. Some of the previous rebellions had not succeeded. The principles of Sun Yixin in the GMD, the three principles, the third of those principles, which was the livelihood of the people, um, like I said, was agreed upon by the Soviets as being socialist enough that they could work with each other. But it's important to know that Jiang Jixi was definitely not a communist. And in fact, as he began his control of the GMD, he systematically began removing communists from key GMD positions, which the communists saw as a, a direct threat. However, the two groups still needed to cooperate with each other to finally rid the country of the warlords. So I just really want to emphasize that Jiang Jixi was not a communist, and as the two groups began to diversify from each other and outright battle each other, you have to know that it's because he's not a communist and hated communists as time went on that the two groups could not continue to cooperate. However, in 1926, the two groups in this first united front uh, launched what was called the Northern Expedition to finally crush the warlords of central and northern China. You can see a map on page 258 of these attacks that were made. The results of this showed an immediate success. And if you look on the map, you can see the warlords that were targeted. In 1927, there were three main areas that were now taken under control and the warlords removed, Hangzhou, Shanghai, and Nanjing. And finally, by 1920, Beijing was under the control of the GMD and CCP working together. So the results of the first united front was that the warlord power was effectively destroyed and the GMD announced that it was now the legitimate government of China, not the CCP. So you can see some recipe for future tension here. So finally, I want to leave you with the immediate cause of the Chinese Civil War, which was when the GMD outright attacked the CCP. This first united front that they had formed to get rid of the warlords was only a friendship, a con convenience. There was no real unity between them because they had differing ideas. And obviously, with Jiang Jixi starting to dismiss communist leaders in the G GMD, it showed that they really didn't have any true common ground. They were just there to take care of a common enemy, similar to how the United States and the USSR cooperated during World War II, but once that was over and Hitler was brought down, there was no longer a reason to cooperate. They had differing ideologies that just were not compatible with each other. So now the CCP had the support from the peasants and the industrial workers, which they had gained through the Northern Expedition, but Jiang Jixi was more sympathetic to landlords and middle classes. And so therefore he continued to try to get rid of any peasantry support and communists that had supported the CCP. He carried out some attacks called the White Terror, 
in Shanghai and targeted people that were a part of the communist support to get rid of them. These purification movements uh, resulted in a quarter of a million Chinese dead, most of them communists and trade unionists and peasants. So finally, the CCP had to flee and the GMD pursued, which was the outbreak of the Civil War.